You disagree with them, they threaten you? Thousands of hacked emails showing global warming scientists blasting researchers who do not buy into their doomsday scenarios. One of the scientists threatening to, and I quote now, beat the crap out of my next guest. Pat Michaels from the Cato Institute joins me now. Pat, welcome to the program. I just want to move on real fast to the threat. Yeah. Uh, let me quote that one. I'm really sorry that you have to go through all this stuff, Phil. Next time I see Pat Michaels at a scientific meeting, I'll be tempted to beat the crap out of him. Very tempted. Now, Pat Michaels is a climate scientist, a senior fellow at a conservative think tank, and a frequent apologist for the fossil fuel industry. Matter is, Can I ask you what percentage changes? of your work is funded by the petroleum industry? I don't know. 40%? I don't know. Okay. Uh, the author of the offending email was Ben Santer. Dr. Santer is a scientist at Livermore National Laboratory, a MacArthur Genius Award winner, and one of the most respected climatologists on the planet. The two men shared the witness table in congressional hearings in November 2010. Did Ben Santer finally beat the crap out of Pat Michaels? You decide. It's warmed up and that people have something to do with it. So what really matters is the magnitude of it. This is the warming uh, from the IPCC, for, from the CRU record from 1950. And our Environmental Protection Agency, which as you know, has taken over the regulatory aspect of this because of what happened in the Congress, uh, issued an endangerment finding on warming. And they asserted in their endangerment finding that more than half of the warming of the late 20th century is a result very likely a result of human greenhouse gases. More than half means more than 50 percent. Late 20th century means after 1950. You agree with that? Second, sorry, I said second half of the 20th century. Well, in fact, there are four different factors that are totally independent of the greenhouse effect. One, that we over underestimated sea surface temperatures from 1944 through 1965. That was published by Thompson and Nature magazine. Number two, that there are non-climatic, subtle effects on the temperature history. That was published by McKittrick and me in Journal of Geophysics uh, Atmospheres. Uh, Susan Solomon found that water vapor in the stratosphere is responsible for a lot of the secular changes. And that we don't know why water vapor is fluctuating in the stratosphere. It's not a greenhouse effect. I mean, it's not, a, it, it's not apparently from greenhouse gas emissions. And number four, Ramanathan at Stanford said, well, about 25 percent of the warming is the result of black carbon going in the atmosphere. That's also not a greenhouse gas. When you add all those up, the warming drops from 0.7 to 0.3 degrees. So the assertion that over half the warming uh, is a function of greenhouse gases is challenged by four completely independent factors. I think we've got a lot more work to do on this, frankly. Any very quick response to that, and then Mr. English. Uh, yes, might I respond Please, to that? Very quickly. Uh, Dr. Michael's analysis is, is wrong. I'm sorry, it's just completely incorrect. Uh, what he's attempted to do here is explain the observed temperature change over the last 60 years, from 1950 through to 2010. And he said that the estimated total change in temperature is 0.7 degrees. Now, he's identified four things economic activity, black carbon, errors in the sea surface temperature data, and stratospheric water vapor, and said, I think all of those things have had a warming influence, so I'm going to subtract them from this 0.7 degrees, and I'm left with 0.3. 0.3 is less than half of 0.7, therefore the IPCC is wrong. And the, the conclusion that more than half of the observed warming over the 20th century was due to uh, very likely due to increases in greenhouse gases, is one of the central conclusions of the IPCC. So if Dr. Michaels is right, that central conclusion is wrong. What Dr. Michaels did not mention, either here or in his um, written testimony, is the cooling effect of sulfate aerosols, which has already been discussed at this hearing. This is uh, a slide from a paper published in 2006 by Peter Stott at the Hadley Center. And what you see in the bottom are three different climate models, and it's the estimate of their sulfate cooling caused by the scattering effects of sulfate aerosols over the 20th century. It's negative. Now, if you assume conservatively <laughs> that that cooling effect over 1950 to 2010, the period Dr. Michaels looked at, was, say, minus 0.4. 
degrees Celsius over that 60-year period. And you assume that Dr. Michaels was completely correct in the estimating the magnitude of the four factors that he removed from the observations. You'd be adding minus 0.4 and plus 0.4. You'd get to zero. So you still need to explain 0.7. You need to get to the observed uh, total temperature change over the 60-year period. What could that be? Could it be the sun? No way. It couldn't be the sun. If solar effects were that large on the 60-year time scale, we'd see a huge 11-year cycle in the temperature data. We don't. Could it be volcanoes? No. It couldn't be volcanoes. Uh, uh, could it be some mode of natural variability, some internal oscillation of the climate system that could generate that 0.7 degree temperature increase? Not plausible. The most plausible explanation is an increase in atmospheric CO2. We know CO2 has changed. Again, that's not uh, some assertion, that's not supposition, we know that. So what the IPCC found here and what they reported on was that actually the uh, change in temperature due to greenhouse gases, which is what you see in red, was larger than the actually observed change in temperature, which is that <coughs> horizontal black line. So the greenhouse gas signal was offset, that's our best understanding, by the cooling caused by these sulfate aerosols. They scatter incoming sunlight and they also change cloud properties. Yeah, thank Excuse you. me. Mr. Excuse me. Very quick. Pardon for a second. Uh, the IPCC gives the range of perspective forcing from sulfate aerosol at zero, a range of from zero to minus two watts per meter That's squared. That's the indirect effect. That gives you an incredible wiggle room anytime you want to make an argument, does it, doesn't it now? It's very interesting to look at sulfate aerosol in terms of the history of science. Now, the first book I ever read at the University of Chicago was The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. I recommend it to everyone. Uh, it predicts that when a paradigm experiences anomalous data, that increasingly strange explanations are brought forth. In 1985, Tom Wigley, who was Ben's advisor, recognized in a paper that the greenhouse gas models were producing too much warming and invoked sulfates. And then you could tune models with sulfates and get things to work perfectly well. Well, the fact of the matter is that our understanding of what the radiative effect of these things are is so wide that I can give you virtually any answer. And so I'm just assuming to leave that alone. Recognize that, uh, Mr. Inglis. And, and uh, I think it's worth following up on that, because, and this is why this hearing is so valuable, because we get to, yeah. these are the kind of things that confuse people and confuse the public a great deal. So Dr. Sander, you want to continue, what's yes, your retort? Yes, if I could. Uh, Dr. Michaels was, was wrong again. He claimed that the IPCC's published estimate of the radiative effect of sulfate aerosols was zero to minus two watts per square meter. That serves for the indirect effect. That's for the effect of aerosols on clouds, on cloud cover and on cloud brightness, which is very uncertain. The IPCC's estimate of the direct scattering effect of aerosols, how they scatter incoming sunlight back into space, does not intersect with zero. It is negative, and the best estimate is of order minus 0.5 watts per square meter. Um, the cooling effect of sulfate aerosols has been established not only observationally and in models and theoretically, in, in, in dozens of, of studies. We can see these things from space. Uh, they're not supposition. This is not science fiction. And leaving out this negative forcing in his testimony to you is misleading you. I'm sorry. Well, the, pro about that? the problem here is uh, that the error bars around these things are very, very large. And furthermore, there's an issue with the sensitivity. Excuse me. I'd like to finish. Uh, this, this discussion is really about the sensitivity of temperature to various and sundry forcings. Uh, and there is quite a discussion as to, in fact, what the change in temperature is per change in watt per meter squared down welling flux. Uh, if it's uh, on the order of, I think, what Lindzen thinks it is, then the sulfates aren't going to be all that important. So this is just, this is an open matter for discussion. I'm sorry, we just don't know everything. Dr. Sander. Might I respond very quickly? I'm glad that um, Dr. Michaels raised the issue of uh, uncertainties. In the fingerprinting work that we do, 
we constantly look at, at uncertainties. They're part and parcel of, of our lives. We look at uncertainties in the fingerprints, those patterns I showed you that arise from use of different models. We look at uncertainties in model estimates of natural climate noise. And we look at uncertainties in the statistical methods that we use to compare models and observations. We spend all our time looking at uncertainties. In this analysis here, you'll see there are no error bars. In this subtraction exercise, no error bars, and the temperature changes are given to within a thousandth of a degree C. Now, to me, uh, again, uh, that is just completely ignoring the significant scientific uncertainties in this partitioning of natural and human effects. You have to account for them. You have to look at all effects, both positive and negative. You can't forget sulfate aerosols. This analysis has not done that, and anything that claims to overturn the central finding of the IPCC's fourth assessment report should do it as thoroughly and comprehensively as possible. This analysis fails in that regard. Is that, is that why one would use 1963 through 1987 when, when there was data through 1995? Is that why one would, uh, in fact, uh, begin a volcanic analysis in 1883 when the atmosphere was loaded with volcanic hmm. junk? Prior to that, I, I'm going to intervene just a little bit. I'll, I'll, uh, I think, under, for understandable reasons, people reach have published different papers, and the, the challenge is if two individuals are sort of in the scientific community going at it with each other, no. it's an interesting and important discussion. And I, and but so I want Dr. Sander to respond to that because you addressed it earlier, Mr. Michaels. But I don't want to dominate, and I'm interrupting my colleague's time here, but I just want to set a little bit of ground. We won't go on forever with this uh, particular right. uh, debate. So is that all right with you, Bob? We yeah. have addressed it. I'll give, the I'll give my colleague more time to. Uh, thank you, Chairman Baird. I really appreciate the opportunity to go on the record on this issue. I thank Pat Michaels for referring to this as the most famous paper ever published in climate science. Uh, and he criticized this analysis uh, back in 1996 when it was published. Um, I'd like to ask uh, to address three aspects of that criticism very, very briefly. Brief. The first aspect was that uh, the editorial process of nature had been interfered with, that somehow I had imposed on nature to publish this paper shortly before the conference of the parties. That's wrong. That's incorrect. The second um, <clears throat> claim is that there was selective data analysis, that we looked at a time period from 1963 to roughly 1988 in observational weather balloon data, compared computer model output with that, and that if you looked at a longer period of record, you got different results. First of all, Professor Michaels was right. If you looked at a longer period of record, you did get different results. Had there been intent to fool people, to uh, manipulate data? No. We used, since we were doing a fingerprint analysis, pattern observational data, gridded data. And at that time, they were only available from one source. That source extended from 1973 through to 1988. When Professor Michaels criticized our paper, we responded as scientists do. We addressed the scientific criticism. What we found was that when we looked at a newly available weather balloon data set that went through to 1995, he was right. And this, this change in the temperature uh, asymmetry between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere had this sort of U shape. What we were able to show and what others have convincingly repeated since then is that that change is forced behavior. If you look at models with combined changes in greenhouse gases and sulfate aerosols, indeed the Stott paper that I mentioned earlier shows that models, when including greenhouse gases and aerosol changes, replicate that behavior. It was not, as Professor Michaels mentioned, some um, representation of natural causes alone. Actually doing the additional science strengthened our confidence in the ability of the models to reproduce this subtle interhemispheric temperature change difference. Yeah. He has not reported, unfortunately, on those responses to his scientific criticism, which I do not think is correct. Well, well you didn't English. give Dave Legates the data. Can I ask uh, I'm gonna one thing? Yield, I'm going to recognize Ask me questions after the hearing, okay, on, on this, written questions. 